Hi, and welcome to module nine of lecture two. In the previous modules in this lecture, we've discussed hypothesis testing and um, both in general and with specific instances based on our type of data. Now we're gonna move on to more particular type of analysis known as ordinary least squares or OLS. So we're gonna begin by talking about why we're gonna do this. So far in the course, we've discussed theory generation, what theories mean and how to develop them. And these theories are broad statements about how um, causal relationships in the world work. And we discussed hypotheses, which are particular um, implications of our theories that are falsifiable with empirical testing. And the goal is to try to reject the null hypothesis associated with every research hypothesis we draw from our theory. And the more we can reject null hypotheses, the more support we have for our research hypotheses, and therefore the more support we have for our theories. That's been the sort of goal so far. What we're gonna do now is take it a little further and try to make more explicit models as to how the world works to test our theories beyond just um, bivariate correlations or checking independence of variables. Now we're gonna produce a model for how we think the world works that will allow us in theory to predict how the world works in addition to just um, testing to see if there's an association between two variables. Although we'll also be able to test for associations using this method. Okay, so we're gonna, we typically assume an additive relationship between independent and dependent variables. This is usually false, um, but it can be a simplifying assumption and accurate for small changes in X. So um, here's a typical assumption. You have a dependent variable Y it's equal to some constant plus um, this lowercase beta one, it's a coefficient um, on the first independent variable x plus some beta two times, a, which is a coefficient on the second independent variable x2. So if x1 and x2 are two different independent variables, y is the dependent variable and beta one and beta two are coefficients that multiply x1 and x2 and alpha is a constant that adds separately. We're going to go through all what all those parts mean um, in the next few slides. Okay. Our hypothesis in general remains the same as before. We're going to assume that some independent variable causes changes in the dependent variable. So let's drop one of the x's and just look at one x. Then we have y, which is the dependent variable, equals alpha, which is a constant, plus beta, which is some coefficient, on x, which is the independent variable. This form, this linear form of an equation of a model specifies that if I change x by one unit of x, then the change in y is a beta unit change in y. So again, if I increase x by one unit, I increase y by beta units. That's how this works. That's the meaning of the coefficient. The meaning of this beta coefficient is the rate of change in, of y with x, as we'll see in a second. Okay. And the way to see this is to think about lines that you might have learned back in high school, or even earlier potentially. Right? All we're doing now is creating lines just like you did lines in Cartesian coordinates earlier on. This y equals alpha plus beta x is a line. Alpha is the y-intercept. The y-intercept is the point in a plane, in a two-dimensional plane, um, in which x is zero. When you make x zero, then you multiply the beta x and get zero. That leaves an alpha, so y is just alpha. So alpha here equals the y-intercept in a line. Beta is the slope of the line. As I increase x, that's how much y increases, right? Rise over run. So at here, y is the rise, x is the run. So the change in um, y is divided by the change in x is going to be beta, the slope. So um, what do we do with this kind of stuff? Well, let's take an example with some fake data. You typically hear the reason for standardized testing is that it's somehow supposed to estimate success in college or grad school or whatever. Right? So here's the SATs are supposed to estimate a student's first year success or for, as measured by their GPA. So what are the independent and dependent variables? Well, here SAT scores are supposed to predict um, GPA, so changing SAT scores is supposed to lead to a change in GPA. So SATs are the independent variable and multiply the coefficient beta. And GPA is the dependent variable on the left-hand side. 
Now what we do, we start with a scatter plot. You always want to start by looking at your data. So we're going to plot some fake data, a bunch of data points. On the x-axis is the independent variable, SAT scores. On the y-axis is GPA, the dependent variable. Again, these are fake, just randomly put there to make the point. Now the goal is to draw a line through these points. Right? We wouldn't call the best fit line. The line that best captures the relationship between our independent and our dependent variable. This line, this best fit line, is going to minimize the sum of the squared errors. It's going to minimize the sum of the squared errors. So we have, um, in a sense, the, the least squared deviations away from the line. So the closer our, point, our data points are to the line we draw, the better our line fits the data. So if all these data points were on the line, we'd have a perfect fit of our data, and our model, our linear model, would be perfectly accurate in predicting our data. The further your data points are away from the line, the less well your line predicts the data. When we do this, and we'll see how to do this later, um, shortly in this series of, of modules, we get estimates for our coefficients of alpha and beta equal to alpha hat, because an estimate, that's where the hat comes from, of, n of negative 0 0.57 and beta hat of 0 0.003. Now you recognize that it looks like over here that, that the y-intercept should be positive, but note, this is for an SAT of 800. This is the inter intercept for a, an SAT score of zero, which can actually happen, but if it could happen, you would take the line all the way down past the axis here, and you would find that the intercept is actually in the negatives. This is often an issue with linear modeling, is that as you extrapolate past the range of your data, you can end up with predictions that are kind of wacky. In this case, um, there's no way that you can have a negative GPA, <laughs> no matter how hard you try. Um, so uh, that's not a very good prediction. We'll see that again in the last lecture, lecture four of this course, when we discuss variables that can only take values between 0 and 1. Um, anyway, so this is the y-intercept here of this line that's formed by minimizing the squared errors, the squared deviations, and this is the slope of the line. The slope is very small because SAT scores are in the hundreds, and you're going to multiply the coefficient times the SAT score to get a, to get a GPA prediction, and the GPA is in the single digits. So you know the beta should be relatively small given the size of the SAT score. Oftentimes you'll see individuals doing research who will normalize their variables so that the coefficients have more comparable meanings. Okay, so you can write alpha hat, you can write A. Either way, it's our estimate of our constant alpha. B is our estimate of our constant beta. Why are these estimates? Why is B or B had an estimate of beta and not just beta? Well, remember, we're sampling from a population. There might be some true model in the world, Y equals alpha plus beta X, but we only have a few data points to calculate our estimates of alpha and beta. So our calculations are necessarily going to be um, estimates of the truth. So um, that's going to be a reason why we talk about estimates here the same way we did before. There are samples, there are uncer there's uncertainty inherent, There'll be estimates, and there'll be error on our estimates, and we'll talk about that a whole bunch in the next module. But here, we have y equals ax plus, sorry, a plus, we have y equals a plus bx, or y equals alpha hat plus beta hat x. Um, our estimate of a or alpha hat is negative 0.57, which is the expected GPA if a person had an SAT score of zero. The b or beta hat is 0 0.003, which is the increase in one's expected GPA for each additional point that one does better on the SAT. So it's the slope of the line that relates um, GPA to SAT scores. If you increase your SAT score by a single point, you should expect an increase in your GPA in this model by 0 0.003. If I increase my SAT scores by 100 points, I should increase, I should increase my GPA, my expected GPA by 100 times 0 0.003 or by 0 0.3. Okay. 
All else we just did here is the method of minimizing the sum of squared errors away from some line. It's called ordinary least squares, and there's a whole bunch of other least squares we'll, you talk about if you go on in, in research methods or statistics. But here, this is the sort of most basic one. It's called ordinary least squares, usually abbreviated as OLS. To use OLS, you need a few, a few assumptions must hold. Um, our dependent variable must be continuous and unbounded. Our dependent variable also must be normally distributed. These are what it should be in theory. In practice, all that is actually pretty robust, and you can get away with it a lot, even when those assumptions are, are, are violated somewhat. Um, that's more of the topic for future stuff. We'll talk about it a little bit into this class, um, in this course. But in general, these are the assumptions to actually accurately, fully accurately use OLS. A continuous and, and, and an unbounded dependent variable, which means there's no limit to how high it can go or how low it can go. And it's not discrete. It's not categorical. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a number. Um, and our dependent variable also would be normally distributed. These assumptions are necessary to use OLS fully accurately. Okay. So how do we calculate these things? Now, you don't have to memorize this stuff. Um, you can always look it up. And most of the time, you're going to be using statistical software anyway to calculate this. But it's good to see where they come from. Um, to derive these, you end up you need calculus. We'll talk a little bit about how that works in the um, later um, later on in, in the module um, in, the, in the lecture rather, but uh, sorry in the next lecture. <laughs> um, but here's here the here's the formula for um, variables for two variables. Um, beta hat here the estimate of your coefficient on x, same as b, is the sum of the deviation of x times the, the corresponding deviation in y. You may remember this is the exact same th term that's in the covariance of x and y, and it exists for the same reason. Beta here is measuring an association between x and y. As x increases, y is going to change according to the association between x and y. If beta hat were 0, there would be no association between x and y, so increasing x would lead to no change in y because x times beta would be zero always, and there'd be no difference in y. Um, so whatever y would, y would be whatever the constant was in that case, because x would not affect y in the slightest. Y would just be alpha, alpha hat. Um, as x and y become more correlated, predicting y depends more strongly on, on having values for x known. So this term on the numerator here, is the covariance without the 1 over n minus 1 term um, because it means the same thing. It's measuring an association between x and y. That's why the covariance term is, is up in the numerator. Now, the denominator normalizes it kind of like it does um, for the correlation, the bivariate correlation. The difference is in the bivariate cor correlation, it was the square root of the variance in x times the variance in y. Here, it's just um, the variance. The, the square error in x. So it's been normalized only by the square the um, square deviations in x. Okay, that's beta hat. Again, you don't need to memorize that, but you should get a sense that the numerator relates to the covariance between x and y, and the denominator relates to the variance in x. So in a sense, you're comparing for associations the covariance between x and y to the variance in x. As the variance in x goes higher, the measured um, coefficient gets smaller because you can, because there's more variation naturally in x and you're less able to sort of attribute um, differences in, to, due to correlations between x and y. As the covariance between x and y get bigger gets bigger, um, the correlation beta gets bigger. Okay. The second term alpha hat's a little easier. You take the mean of y and you subtract the estimate of beta times the mean in x. And that gives you alpha hat. Um, so there's your estimate of alpha. Okay. Note the only information you need to calculate alpha and beta are the values of the dependent and independent variables. Each formula relies on the means of both variables. So you calculate the means, you calculate the deviations, you square them, you add a bunch of stuff up, you plug it in, you can get both of these things just fine. However, because they rely upon the means, 
right? They're sensitive, sensitive to outliers, as we saw earlier. So an outlier can really affect the mean and also, therefore, really affect our estimates for beta and alpha, which can be problematic and which we'll discuss a little later as well. Um, but these things, again, are the estimates of the true unknown alpha and beta in the population estimated from our sample of data that we use to perform the OLS, the Ordinary Least Squares Regression. We'll continue this discussion in the next module.